We have got with us the wonderful Steve Begu, uh, who is the head of education for Christian Concern. And uh, Christian Concern is um, a, an organization that I think many of you will be familiar with uh, if there are different cases in the news. It's often them who brought it to the forefront of Christians who are struggling in life and various things happening to them along the way. Uh, so, Steve, you, you are a very experienced, you've been a head teacher at a Christian school. You're a wonderful, wonderful man who um, I've had the privilege of getting to know over the last couple of years, few years now, isn't it? And um, we're very grateful that you're here with us today. So let's just pray for Steve. Father, we pray that as Steve shares with us, that you will speak through him. Um, that what he says will stir us and equip us and help us to be the most effective we can be with the precious grandchildren you've entrusted to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Over to you, Steve. Amen. Well, thanks ever so much, Ollie, for that very kind <laughs> introduction. Um, it's a delight to be able to, to be together with you. Um, I'm here in Oxfordshire. Uh, it's getting quite cold. Um, I've just put my, my jumper on. I actually bought myself an extra heater that arrived in the post today that I've got just over in the corner there to try and keep my warm, my my room warm. Um, it's delightful to be with you. And uh, I'm just going to have a go at sharing the screen there. Is that is that working? Give me a thumbs up, Ollie, if that's worked. It's now, yeah, we're there. Excellent. Brilliant. So as Ollie said, yes, I work for Christian Concern. I'm, I'm one of the team there. I'm the head of the education department. So anything to do with education particularly comes comes through to me. Um, and if you are interested in discovering the work of Christian Concern, please do go online and I encourage you to consider getting some some emails from us that come in regularly just to talk about the, the key issues that are coming up. Some of the key legal cases that um, Ollie was talking about there, often there to do with children and, and young people and the education world, um, which is why they started an education department, which I, I lead about three, three years ago that was started. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it's delightful to be here with you. And um we're going to have some some good time together and I, please do feel free to ask any questions of any nature I'm, I'm quite happy to to be probed about the things that I've said so keep any notes I don't know if you can you can actually put things on the chat as well I'm sure that that's okay with with Ollie if, if things come to mind but um my opening thought is this I was uh I was singing in the car while I was traveling up to some engagements in Sunderland just last week and I was singing along to my my Spotify worship playlist, feeling very technologically sound that I'd managed to develop a Spotify worship playlist where it plays all sorts of worship songs, hymns and all sorts of things. And um, this old hymn came up that I'd obviously put on there. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? And I was, I was singing that as I was driving up to, to Sunderland. As I sang it, I remembered as a child hearing my grandfather singing that song, that hymn in church. And with, with tears in his eyes, with a quivering, grateful voice, singing loudly the praises of God. His blood availed for me. His blood, I, I can picture him now singing that. And I was reminded of that as I was, as I was singing it and driving up to Sunderland. And when he prayed out, my grandfather, when he prayed, it was always with meaning. It was expressive and it was it was grateful and humble, truly authentic prayer from the heart. And when, when my grandfather died, I remember um, being sat with my with my grandma at my precious grandpa's funeral. And she was by that stage riddled with Parkinson's disease. And understandably, she was fearful about the, the loneliness and uncertainty that the future might hold for her for her care, because my, my grandfather had done a lot of that for her. And in that same church with my, which my grandfather had actually helped build, the, the actual bricks had been laid by him. In that church, um, I sat with my precious grandmother at his funeral and um this hymn came up as we were as we were there this first chosen hymn came up great is thy faithfulness O god my father and as the first notes from the organ played 
an introduction. My, my nan, who was sat next to me, riddled with, with Parkinson's, she attempted to stand up. And everyone around her, family members, friends, starts to try and say, no, 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 you mustn't feel like you, you need to stand. Just stay, stay, that's okay. And they could see how hard it was for her to, to physically stand up. But she was resolute. And she, and she said, I can see her face turning around to the people around her saying, I'm going to stand and sing this. And, and the look in her eyes was, and don't you try to stop me. And she, she stood and she worshipped, singing, great is thy faithfulness. I had the privilege of standing next to my nan and singing out, great is thy faithfulness. At a moment where she might well have doubted that. But in that moment, her faith shone through to me, her grandson. And I will never forget her example, their example of worship, their their prayer, their perseverance in faith. And I was in, I'm in no doubt to this day of their, their deep love for God. I've no doubt either that I will see them both again. That had a profound effect on my life. Never underestimate the power of your example, your words, your prayers for your children and grandchildren. Yes, the culture has changed. Yes, grandchildren can be increasingly distant in a variety of ways. Yes, the sexuality and gender ideology, ideology issues, they're all there and they can become so confusing, can't they? But the truth of your faith and the testimonies of your faith and of your faithfulness can still be a powerful influence in their lives. Great is thy faithfulness. And they can see this especially modelled through your lives, grandparents. You can be an example of God's faithful character to them. But Steve... You might say, Steve, I just don't get it. I don't understand how they can be thinking that a girl can be a boy. I I just don't understand how so quickly everyone, and including our grandchildren, they assume that marriage can be between two men or two women. Maybe you don't realise these things quite yet, but they are increasingly being inducted into a whole new way of thinking. And there is a clash of values. Perhaps I can explain it in a way which will, will help you understand what's going on here. So since the 1960s, some of you will remember the 1960s. Since the 1960s, especially the extravagant promises of pleasure and freedom through free love have metastasized and evolved into something much more accepted by many, not just the kind of flower power few, but many, and especially by the current shapers of society. The teachers of our children have already been shaped by this new way of thinking, especially the young teachers. And it's even shaping the teaching in many churches, which want to be accessible and inclusive and loving. And what we're finding is that the basic Christian beliefs, that even that it's possible to know things, that there's absolute truth, that it's possible to know things, to know that there are facts that are true, even that, that there are true facts that can be known from trusted authorities. Even that, this, this belief that there are true things that can be known, even that is being jettisoned to some degree. The Christian basic belief that God made a knowable universe, which we can observe and understand, that we might fill and subdue it. You remember what it says in Genesis, the purpose of mankind. This kind of belief is being removed from their thinking. Why? Let, let me explain. It's because the, 
the new thinkers, the new priests and teachers to society are now not Christian, not based in a Christian worldview background. I mean, who, who trusts now what the church says anyway? Cool. That's the kind of attitude. And indeed, the, they, the new shapers of society, would believe that and say that Christianity itself is the reason for all sorts of the ills of society. It's the reason for oppression. It's the reason for a lack of freedom. It's the reason for a lack of pleasure and happiness and flourishing for all people, especially different sorts of people that might have different thoughts and feelings. Christianity itself is an oppressive problem. These new thinkers and the, the teachers and the, the priests of society now, they believe that all authority is always oppressive and that the, the truths from religion or even from science, the things we should understand from a knowable universe, that things like that, like, like biology, that you could actually know that because you've got these genitals, that that means something significant and real about you. Even that has been used to oppress you and to limit you from who you might believe yourself to be. So the new thinking says we must kick out the Bible from schools. We must question the sexual morality that's been handed down to us from our grandparents era. All of that is only going to oppress us. That's how the underlying thinking goes. Indeed. So the teaching goes to be truly free and we must be truly free, free to be flourishing and happy. The only thing we can do is to respond to the one and only thing that we can actually trust, they say. The one thing that you could actually trust, the one thing that isn't trying to oppress you, the, the one thing they would say is yourself. Your own feelings seven-year-old boy 13-year-old girl this is the way to flourish they would say to trust only yourself and it, and it especially includes being free to respond to any sexual attraction feelings that you might have or free to recreate yourself in line with the only thing you can trust about who you are your inner gender feelings that's why our children and grandchildren are starting to think as they do and have different beliefs and values that are outside of the Christian worldview that you or I may have always understood and thought as well. This is just the way we think, isn't it? This is the worldview they're immersed in. And a biblical foundation to who they are and what is even true that is being lost. And so now, rather than understanding themselves as created by God, but fallen and in need of a saviour, and that Christ has the, the best way to live for us in following him and for on into eternity, children and young people are told by the, the priests and the teachers of society of the day through the media, through songs through celebrities through the narratives in films and school that it's emphasized to them that there isn't a god it's emphasized to them there is no creator or at, at the very best you are some kind of beautiful accident of evolution in this universe they teach there's no fallenness or sin which we need rescuing from and the way to be a flourishing person in fact the way to be a flourishing person in life is to follow the feelings you have as an autonomous individual. That's who you are. These are the things which really, truly create you and shape you. That's how that teaching goes. You can see it's, it's vastly different from a Christian biblical understanding of who we are and what the truth is. And what they're told is. That the more you accept these things, these feelings, and the more everyone around you, including your parents and your grandparents, anyone around you accepts these things, 
then the happier everyone will be in society in this short life that we have now. And so they no longer trust even biology. I am now the sex I feel I might be. They no longer trust marriage. Any form of family life is as good as any other, isn't it? Just go with what you feel. That's where they're at. They no longer feel accountable to anyone but themselves, as there's no God to be accountable to. Or, or if, there, if there is a God, they've got some vestiges of belief, then he doesn't really have any authority or right to show me how to live. He's kind of there to stroke me and to make me feel better about my autonomous self. The feelings that I have. There's no concept of sin or fallenness. However, there is some some good news with this. The more I talk to young people, the more I study this, the more I look at what's going on. You know, most of them deep down, even though they're immersed in this new way of thinking, deep, deep down, there are very few total true believers of this this way of thinking and this ideology. They may assert or assert the mantras of love is love and even wave a pride flag at a thing, but they don't. They don't feel settled in their thinking around these things. They're they're mostly still deeply confused and uncertain. And many of them have huge mental health issues because these ideological foundations based in yourself and your feelings, they're not strong. They don't work in life because they're not true. And if, as I suspect, your children and grandchildren have been given some examples of a different way, a Christian way. There will always be a conflict and a clash of those values going on inside them, a conflict because they see the difference and they see that it doesn't stand up. And I dare to suggest that here's where you all come in. So imagine Imagine a grandmother or a grandfather who has committed their lives in lifelong committed heterosexual man marriage. Imagine having them in your life. Modelling this to them. And explaining it. Opportunities like wedding anniversaries or at your birthdays, explaining how the Lord has been good to them and how they followed his biblical pattern for their lives as they followed Jesus Christ. Imagine being a grandchild who's got a grandmother or a grandfather like that in their life. Do you know what? This challenges that whole other way of thinking and it encourages them into the right way. Imagine a grandmother or a grandfather who, when hearing, listening to the challenges that their grandchild is is facing issues at school maybe or issues with relationships confusion about their identity imagine a grandmother who really listens and commits and tells them commits i'm going to pray for you as you journey through these challenges imagine a grandfather sharing testimony of how god has helped him not not just through the years, but through the decades. Real stories, true stories, testimonies of faith and of faithfulness, pointing to great is thy faithfulness. This will influence them. Imagine when it's their birthday, a grandparent that's buying them a Bible or Christian storybook and writes in their birthday cards, messages from the Bible, or writes specific heartfelt prayers for them. This shows them, this will model to them a different way of thinking. It models to them the love of God. But it can be hard, can't it? It, it can be so so easy to think, how on earth can they dress like that? How can they, in their appearance, do that to themselves? Um, how can their parents let them do that? How can they think about 
that issue in that way in talking so much about being a vegetarian or a vegan or the climate change stuff or the sexuality and gender stuff oh and of course you're probably right about a lot of those things and I, and i'm sure you try not to be the grumpy judgmental commentator on everything you see in their lives that can be tempting though can't it and as a grandparent you know that the weapon of your disapproval is actually a very blunt instrument anyway isn't it and as a grandparent and not a parent you don't have the same remit or god-given authority to correct as a parent has and actually you have a different privilege and a different gift that's right for you to use as you bring influence to your grandchildren if you do get into conversations with them let them talk out their ideas and their thoughts let them talk it through and you know they love to pontificate sometimes as they get to older ages and you know all of us thought we knew it all when we were younger at some point didn't we just add in your own thoughts, add in your own questions that just help them to question maybe some of the things that they're saying. Bring in your own stories and testimonies, build that relationship with them. You can do this in a very special and precious way as a grandparent in a way that actually parents often struggle to do. As I was praying, I felt the Lord wanted to bring some biblical wisdom to us as well in this this session and as I was praying about how to help grandparents consider their attitude in, in all of this as they seek to influence their grandchildren I um, was thinking about grandparents really seeking to be received by their grandchildren and wanting to be received by their grandchildren and I was drawn to John chapter 1 um, verses 11 to 17 and I'm gonna um, just attempt to share my screen again here so you can you don't have to turn there but hopefully you'll be able to see it when I get to the slide. John chapter 1 verses 11 to 17. I felt the Lord wanted to speak to us something through this. John says this of Jesus. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke of when I said, He who comes after me surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received, all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So I was praying, I felt the Lord wanted to bring advice to us and guidance from his word to us. And in, in um, verses 11 to 13, as it was saying those things, you know, you as a grandparent, like Jesus, you can point them to become something amazing, something wonderful. Children of God, like you are. You see, Jesus was the son of God and he came and he showed them that they could be children of God. This is the truest and most beautiful 
identity they can ever know about and have. So important for them to understand. And you can model that to them and share that with them, just like Jesus did in the way that he came. In verse 14, I just felt the Lord highlight this to me as I read it. You know, identify with them. Identify with them as much as you can. This is Jesus. This is how he came to us through the incarnation that we'll be remembering at Christmas time. You know, remember your own challenges at their age. Cast your mind back. Put yourself back into their shoes. You had issues that you were working through at that time. And really listen to them out from that understanding. Try and overlook the many things you could be disapproving of so that you can identify with them and communicate with them just like Jesus did for us. Verse 14 and 16. Be full of grace and truth. This is how the Lord led us, leads us to be. And this is combination of the two, grace and truth. And this is how Jesus came and showed his glory. You know, they believe there's some glory in this other way of thinking of the whole flourishing of human beings. But Jesus came and showed us really what glory is through following him and seeing what he is like. You can show them his glory, grandparents, by there being both grace and truth filling us. You know, some of us can incline more towards being full of truth from the law of what's clearly right and wrong. And others of us can incline towards being so full of grace, just wanting to shower them in love and nurture. Jesus came full of both, full of grace and truth. And he showed us who God his father was through being filled with grace and truth, the truth of that and the love and the grace of that. He showed us who his father was, that we might be his children. Grumpy, graceless truth used with the weapon of disapproval will not bring about the glory of God and give you the chance of being received. You want your own to receive you, don't you? <laughs> but silent, truthless grace, in inverted commas, isn't actually grace. Because part of the blessing and grace of God is to testify to the truth. The truth will set them free if delivered with grace. We must speak the truth in love, as Paul says elsewhere finding the best incarnational way to do so. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He knows how to help us to do this. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. How? Full of grace and truth. As I bring my, my thoughts to a, to a close, you may have realised that I'm not yet a grandparent. I don't know if you've spotted that yet because of my youthful looks, but I'm, I'm not yet a grandparent, but I am a parent. I've got three lovely daughters. Go low tech for a moment rather than slideshow. Here's my photo I've got by my, by my screen. There we go. There's my wife and my three, my three daughters, 21, 17 and 12. We weren't very original with names. No, no, that's their ages. Sorry, that's a terrible joke. Um, yeah. They're precious to me, my precious daughters, but I'm not yet a grandparent. But I have done quite a bit of research into this area. And just I was interviewing recently a, a couple in our church stream who are in their late 70s and have got many grandchildren and some wonderful testimonies, incredible wisdom with their multiple grandchildren, which has shaped these thoughts that I've been sharing with you tonight. And they also shared a few other pearls of wisdom that I'm just going to also put out there. And I know we've got some other wisdom that can be shared here from many of you. Um, as we go into groups and things later as well. Um, and from the Golden Books, it's brilliant having them with us. But these were just a few things that they said to me. I thought, I just want to I just want to pass these on to you. Um, the grandfather who I was talking to commented, you know, there's no real remit to correct, but there is a way to weave in your own experience to bring advice. There is. And that can make a difference. And he knows it can make a difference because he, he's seen it happen. 
and the ho the humble vulnerable building bridges approach that you can you can take helps them to walk over that towards you and helps you to be able to connect with them he says lecturing alienates so he's learned not to do that <laughs> um but to take the opportunity afforded to being different from being their parent and he says whatsapp is brilliant he he whatsapps individually his grandchildren regularly to keep the communications open um and they forward stories of miracles and just great testimonies of things that he finds to keep keep that pointing to god's faithfulness going on and he, he gives them a leather bound study bible when they get to the age of 18 with some personal um sheets, sheets of paper for them to stick into that um of, of a message from him to them actually from both him and his wife and the, the grandmother i thought it was a great idea by the way and um, the grandmother said yeah i want that i want my grandchildren to see me as a safe place to communicate and she told me about this incredible story of horrible mental health issues going on for one of her grandchildren and how because she'd been able to keep that fun relational communication going on on through text messages and and when they met that actually it was it was her that she came to when she just wanted to offload and unload a whole load of stuff that was going on for her that was really pivotal in seeing changes start to happen in her mental health the parents actually dealt with the big heavy issues on the ground which actually her as a grandparent couldn't have coped with but she was able to play a, a really big and important part in being available in a safe place for the granddaughter to be able to communicate she said it's it's a good thing to just kind of be fun and do the whole yo yeah we're getting old aren't we aren't we silly stuff to just kind of be able to connect with them and um, and to make the most of those special occasions and moments of birthdays or kind of the rites of passage of going off to university make the most of those occasions in writing them things sending them things sending them messages that means a lot to them you'd be surprised quite how much that means to your grandchildren that you take the time to do that both of them said to me they love getting together the, the whole family as, as many of the family as they can and and to work hard themselves to facilitate and plan to help make that happen because they find their children they often feel like well it's not my place to organize that or to do that. and they're often really busy and i'm sure you're busy too but there's there's something that kind of goes down the priority list because they also feel it's not their place to organize that so they've made a made a lot of gathering the family together and they see the positive influence of of kind of good christian role models of cousins and other aunts and uncles and as the grandparents kind of get being a gathering point, you can set a tone in the way that you do all of that, that allows for great things to be passed on to them. That's what they were saying. Um, and they say that their grandchildren constantly are saying to them, I would love to do that again. Can we get together again? Can we rent a, a house out somewhere and do that again? Can we all come around? To... And they're, they're regularly saying that to them. And, um, and the wife explained um, how her husband, the, the grandfather, prays, he always says grace whenever they have those meals together when they gather and as she was saying to me he can't ever pray and say grace over those meals without tears filling his eyes and praying father god i'm thanking you so much for this this wider family that you've you've given to us that we can gather in this kind of way share this meal together and he just pulls out his thanks as he thanks for the food and he says that is something very powerful and very special and a way to to bless the grandchildren especially it invests in memories that are wonderful family memories that can be built but also with that spiritual context that christian worldview that underpins who who you are as a grandparent i know that not everybody's home circumstances can make those things possible but there might be some things in there that can be things that can be can be focused on and drawn from you may want to discuss those things in the groups in a bit well my my final word um is yes there may be a clash of values clash of cultures going on but grandparents in a relationship to father god through jesus christ and being filled with the power of his spirit grandparents can point their grandchildren to the truth to the one who is the truth we can point them to the most important truths about their identity as created by God and special to us and special to God. We can point them to that in the way that we handle things with them. We can point them to the fact that they 
are fallen and sinful. And guess what? All the feelings and thoughts you have inside yourself, mm, they might need to be submitted to God to help you, to guide you, to shape you. We can point them towards the most important relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can model that to them. Knowing that with us, they too can learn what it means to be and become children of God. We were hearing about what John was saying that Jesus came to help us do. As I said at the start, never underestimate the power of your example, your words, your prayers for your children and your grandchildren. Yes, culture has changed. Yes, grandchildren can be increasingly distant in many ways. Yes, the sexuality and gender ideology stuff has become so confusing, but the truth of your faith and the testimonies of your faith and of your faithfulness communicated with much grace can can still be a powerful influence in the lives of your grandchildren as they grow and as you develop in your relationship with them. Thank you for listening um, to what I've shared and um, over to Ollie now to take us on. Thanks, Steve. That's great. And I hope you feel encouraged. If you are doing something with your grandchildren, then it is having an impact. Uh, that's one of the things I've taken from what you said, Steve. Even if you can't see it, even if it doesn't look like it, even if it feels like it's thrown back in your face, for some of you, I know that will be the case, but you are having an impact. And I love the story you started with, Steve, of, uh, of your grandfather and the impact he had on you. I wonder if he ever knew or realised just by belting out at him next to you, it made such an impact on you. We, we just don't know the impact we're having and, and this is a, a crazy world which we're in you're not the crazy one that's another thing i've taken from what <laughs> you said steve you are not the crazy one um it is the world that's gone off the deep end and has moved away from the lord um and and some of you are blessed that your children are following the lord and your grandchildren are following the lord and they need your voice in their life to help them be who they're called to be and some of you um are blessed because you have children and grandchildren but at the moment, they're not walking with the Lord and that brings its own tensions. We we want to give you a chance to uh, kind of pick through some of that and talk through some of what Steve's been saying. There was an awful lot in there. The whole grace and truth aspect as well. It might be you want to dive into some of that. I thought there's a that was really rich um, what you were showing. And then uh, when we come, we'll give you about 10 minutes in small groups together. And when we come back, we're going to pass over uh, to my parents who've got some uh, some more ideas and some practical tips to share. And we'll pull some things together a little bit as well from that. Um...